I'm ready whenever you're ready. Are you ready? I'm rolling. Okay, good enough. I'd like to welcome you to the last in our series of faculty lectures for 1989. I hope those of you who are regulars have enjoyed the series, and I hope that you and those of you who are not regulars will plan to be regulars with us next year. Today's speaker is Dr. Evelyn Dandy, and her title is, What is it like being the only one? And I must say that Dr. Dandy very graciously agreed to fill in for us. Uh, someone else was on the schedule for this time slot, and here at the last minute, she was very nice and was filled in for us. So I hope you'll welcome Dr. Dandy. Thank you, Mrs. Brower, and thank you all for your applause and your attendance to my dean and to my department head and my colleagues who are here and my students who are here and my friends. I welcome you here and ask you, what is it like to be the only one? I ask you, what is it like to be a token? Um, maybe I can just say, have any of you ever been the only one in a situation? Would you raise your hand, please, if you've just ever been the only one? Oh, just so everybody feels that phenomenon. Let me ask you some more questions. Uh, how did you feel when you were the only one? What did you say? These are rhetorical questions. Uh, your reactions to things that were said. Did you feel a little strange? Did you feel a little set apart from the others? How long were how many of you would like to be a token more often? Raise your hand if you'd like to be the only one often. Thank you. All right. I'd like to address being the only one. And I think it's timely to address this issue uh, as I look at television and in newspapers about uh, what's currently going on in this country. Uh, I look at just last Sunday at the living section, and I saw that in 1963, Otis Johnson entered Armstrong State College as the only one, a token. He was, in he was accompanied by an entire squad of area law enforcement officials in riot gear. 26 years ago, certainly now, things have changed. Armstrong now enrolls some 535 students out of 3,220. Those 523 are minority students. Uh, we have a full-time minority recruiter who represents a constituency that serves as liaison between the college and the community. We have nine African-American faculty, three of whom are full professors. That's an anomaly on some campuses. We have an entire program that is dedicated to recruiting minorities in the health career. We have actively recruited minority faculty members from as far as Berkeley. Uh, we are looking forward to the presence of an African American department head in the School <coughs> of Health Professions. And I am lecturing to my esteemed colleagues and my students about the dynamics of tokenism. So we have come a distance, but I admonish you and say that we still have a way to go. Some of the reactions that were witnessed by Dr. Johnson 26 years ago were reported by current Armstrong State College students in a panel discussion that we had in February on this campus. It is my purpose today to present to you some of the issues voiced by students and faculty who attended that session and to share with you what researchers and experienced tokens have to say about the phenomenon of I speak from my experiences as one of six black students in a predominantly black campus in, 19, in the early 1960s. There were some 1,500 students on my campus, and six of us were black. I also speak as a minority faculty member who has been the only one in many settings here at Armstrong State College in the last 14 years. What is it like being the only Tokens. The only one is called a token. A token is a deviation or a person who differs from 
other group members. They are people identified by ascribed characteristics that carry with them a set of assumptions. Assumptions about culture, and status, and behavior. They are viewed as representatives of their ascribed category, whether they like it or not. There are two conditions which heighten and dramatize the effects of tokenism. One is the extent to which the token mirrors his or her ethnicity. There is an unwritten scale that begins with light-skinned black females and ends with dark-skinned black males that wear a beard. So from one end to the next, you see a continuum. Now, light-skinned black females can escalate their ethnicity by wearing African garb and braids. So they can suddenly become, come to the very other end of that continuum. The other condition that, mirror, that uh, heightens and dramatizes the effect of tokenism is <clears throat> the recency of black presence at an institution. It should have been much easier for a black male to enter Armstrong State College uh, 26 years ago and graduate. It should have been more difficult for a black male to enter Armstrong State College and graduate uh, than it was to get to then be in the room. So those black males in the audience who have beards then should look forward to a hasty graduation we hope, from Armstrong State College. If indeed we are progressing, that should be the case. A lot of the information that I'm getting is coming from Rosabeth Moss Cantor's work. Uh, 1977, she examines the, examines the phenomenon of tokenism by looking at how group structures shape interaction. She has developed a scale that defines various proportional representations from uniform groups that have only one person of a kind. One significant social type and is presented, that very first group is presented 100 to zero. That's a group where there are no deviations there are no tokens. A skewed group is represented by the proportion of 85 to 15. 85 to 15. This group has a large preponderance of one type over another. Cantor terms the large group as dominance and the small group as tokens. I use this description to compare Armstrong's blacks and whites, minorities and majorities, tokens and dominance because the percentage of blacks on this campus approximates about 15%. According to Cantor, numerically dominant types control the group and its culture. So if there are predominant whites in a group, then they will control that group, and they will control that group's culture. And what the dominant group does then becomes the norm. The tokens become symbols then of the group that they represent. Notice she said that the tokens are symbols. They don't, they're don't. they not even individuals. They merely become symbols. Uh, Candace's description of tokens uh, is that they're symbols, not individuals. They are in the position of representing their ascribed category to the group. When they choose, whether they choose to or not, tokens will always be hyphenated people. Uh, by hyphenated people, I mean female salespersons, uh, black physicians, black students, black faculty. As long as I remain at Armstrong State College and the ratio of blacks to whites is as it is, I will be considered a token, a black faculty member. Dominants perform perceptions about uh, tokens. Each perception carries with it a set of responses. So when there is a dominant group and they think in terms of the less dominant group or the tokens that are in that group, they form certain perceptions. And their perceptions of those tokens then color their actions. And their perceptions also color the actions of the tokens. Uh, and many times their perceptions and the tokens' reactions bring pressure to bear on the tokens. If you've been a token before, raise your hand if you've had pressure to bear on you. Obviously. Okay. Being a token, as we said before, is not easy. The success of tokens in dealing with the perceptions of the dominance to some extent it determines
determines how their performance will be evaluated. Indeed, it determines whether or not they'll survive. My husband and I were talking about being a token, uh, and to him, he's been a token before. I guess maybe most blacks have been tokens before, and talked about whether or not we can survive as tokens, and we decided that whether or not we decide to survive depended not only upon what the group thought of us, but what, of what we thought of ourselves. According to Cantor, dominance generates three general perceptions of tokens. As I said before, each perception carries with it a set of pressures and consequences. And these perceptions are three. They include, first, visibility, awareness of tokens. When tokens are small in a numerical proportion, they have a larger share of dominant attention. They are constantly visible, in other, one, in other words. This visibility presents pressure to perform. All tokens have to do is walk into a room and people notice them. Is that right? Yeah. <laughs> tokens are highly visible. Students who are tokens cannot skip class and go unnoticed. If they're late to class, it seems that everything stops, and all students watch the tokens walking in late. The token's lateness makes him carry the burden of representing all black students who go late to college classes. Students have reported that they could almost read thoughts as they walk into the classroom late. Here he comes again, late. He's always late, just like blacks. They're always late. Now, blacks can be highly visible when it comes to appearance in a class, but they can also become invisible when it comes to participating in class discussions. In an article in last Sunday's Living section, Dr. Johnson mentioned that when he was at Armstrong, he received the invisible man treatment. Did you see that in the paper? He said he was the invisible man. Some students at Armstrong have described this treatment this way. They say, you're not there. You're there, but you're not there. The instructor does not maintain eye contact with you. He looks through you. He rarely calls on you to answer questions. Minority students are seldom called upon because they're not expected to know the answers to questions. You may raise your hand, but there's always someone in the dominant group who has the answer that the instructor wants. The instructor, as well as members of the dominant group, may totally ignore you. The ignoring can result in feelings of isolation and loneliness. Have you ever been ignored as a token? You can say yes. <laughs> All right, another student described it this way. Minority students cannot get their concerns addressed by majority faculty because majority students tend to dominate the faculty members' time. Low expectations seem to be a serious concern as students come to me individually and tell me they're very much concerned that their teachers don't expect very much of them. Good and Brophy define expectations as inferences teachers make about the future behavior or ac academic achievement of their students based on what they know about students now. For the most part, teachers are unaware of their classroom interactions with students. They're unaware especially those students they deem as low achievers. Brophy and others indicate that uh, teachers mirror their expectations of students through their nonverbal behaviors, uh, their eye contact. Have you ever sat in a room and not had eye contact with the person who was talking to you, with the teacher? Uh, affirmative head nods and smiles. Through the amount of time a student is given to respond to a question before the teacher gives the answer and moves on to another student. Through re-instruction, re-instruction <clears throat> of students, excuse me, in failure situations, such probing or restating questions <clears throat> until the student gives the correct answer. And through evaluative feedback and constructive criticism. Can I have a drink of water? I really need a microphone. Can you hear me back there? <clears throat> if the dominant group sets the norms for the group and the tokens represent the stereotypical low achievers, expectations for these students could color the teacher's evaluation. Tokens could fall victim to these tainted evaluations regardless of their actual achievement. 
I've had students tell me that regardless of how well they do on a test, especially a te an essay test, the teacher doesn't think they will do well. And so those expectations uh, sort of fill out. And so they don't do well, uh, regardless of how much they know. This still happens. <clears throat> Another perception formed by the dominant is assimilation. Tokens, attributes are distorted to fit pre-existing generalizations about their social type. Tokens are assimilated into playing limited roles in the system. Okay? Not only could there be a heightened visibility and invisibility, but there could be a fear of visibility among tokens. Um, some tokens try to minimize their differences by looking like the dominant group as much as possible and deliberately keeping a low profile. They avoid conflicts. They avoid risks. They avoid controversial situations for fear of retaliation. They purposely take on the look, the talk, and the attitude of the dominant group uh, to the extent of even avoiding other minorities. They allow themselves to be viewed as exceptions to the general rule uh, that others of their category have a variety of undesirable or unsuitable characteristics. Uh, this phenomenon involves role change which the tokens become a pet for the dominant culture. Something interesting happened to me when I, 20 some years ago, went to college. Uh, I wasn't aware of the fact that I might have passed for another race. Okay? I went think, knowing that I'm black and not thinking that anyone would think other than that. Uh, little did I know that one question that was asked of me on that college campus determined my future on that college campus. That one question was asked in a social situation in the rat race. That was where we all went to eat. And uh, it wasn't the cafeteria, but it was, it was where we went to talk and have fun. Okay? Thank you. Ice, too. <laughs> Someone asked me, are you Italian? Okay? Are you Italian? And I just looked know, very strangely at the person and said no. Uh, from then on, perceptions of me changed. And I did not, I was not aware that these perceptions were as they were. I was not aware that people were thinking that I was something that I was not. Later I found that that happens quite often. That happened to me in a, in a uh, spa. I sat and had a wonderful conversation with the lady. And we exchanged telephone numbers. My head was covered, and most things were covered. We <laughs> are in a spa in, in a steam room. And uh, we talked and really enjoyed, and we had so much in common. But when we got out of the steam room, and we said, you know, well, I'll talk to you tomorrow, and she suddenly looked at me, she saw me in a different light. And so I became a very different person. I don't know if that's happened to you, uh, but it's, it's a strange feeling. Uh, you don't really... I grew up not really know, thinking that if I were another color it would make any difference to me. I grew up knowing that what I am was great and it didn't make any difference whether I was something else or not. Um, that's a strange phenomenon. Uh, I am sure that I would receive a lot more examples of racism if my skin were a different hue. I'm positive of that. As a matter of fact, I think there's a positive relationship between your skin color and racism and, and, and acts of racism that you might receive. And more especially so with males than females. And why? I think that comes from what's done in the media. Carl Rowan addressed that in his editorial this past week. <clears throat> At a recent forum, one faculty member described black students on a continuum from those who uh, come here and look very black, and wear African garb, and little hats that you see, to those who come here and look very white. There is a long continuum. <clears throat> the third kind of perception <clears throat> formed by dominance is what's called polarization. In polarization, differences between dominance and tokens are exaggerated, and group boundaries are set up. Can reports that in some cases, dominants do not wish to carry out certain activities in the presence of a token. 
They have secrets to preserve. Dominants move the locus of some activities and expressions away from public settings to which tokens have access. They do this to provide private settings uh, from which tokens can be excluded. It is in these private settings that strategies are discussed and decisions are made. Cocktail parties, informal dinners. If we take this polarization concept and apply it to token faculty, we might say that since token faculty are not often privy to these private settings, they might, might not be aware of the strategies they need to use to move upward in this institution or in any institution. Faculty that, to, token faculty then are not integrated into the social network and hence might be trapped in low level positions, merely because they do not have ample feedback about what they should do to move up. Kander describes the phenomenon as informal isolation. A student gave another example of polarization. I quote, what are my, my, my rights in getting an extension on an exam if a family member is ill? My father had a stroke and I asked the instructor if I could take the exam another time. I was informed that she had to think about it. Yet, a majority student at the end of class period asked if she could take the test another time because she had not had enough time to study. The instructor informed her immediately that the test would be postponed. There is a common saying among blacks that you must work twice as hard to earn half as much. If one questioned a practice, there is fear of retaliation. We had a study group when I was in college, Spanish, a Spanish class. And we used to get together every evening and translate our assignments. And we would study for tests so that almost all of us would have virtually the same answers because we all use the same content on our test. But when we took our test, I noticed that I always received Bs, and my friends, my fellow students, received As. Well, I sort of became suspicious, but I dared not say anything for fear of retaliation. I had students say the same thing here at Armstrong to me 20 some years later. Why is there a need to address concerns of tokenism in 1980? There is a growing diversity in this country. The problems in the larger society are now being reflected on college campuses. There are documented incidents of racial prejudice. There is a resurgence of it at predominantly white institutions. It's on TV. Even last year, there was a national teleconference on racism on campus. Recently, Oprah Winfrey hosted two shows on racism, strategies for eliminating Last week, Phil Donahue interviewed David Duke, who was recently voted into public office. Uh, most of the show addressed racism. Carl Rowan's column last Sunday addressed racism. How are colleges around the country coping with this problem of racism on college campuses? Well, one plan has received uh, national attention. Donna Shalala who is chancellor of the University of Wisconsin at Madison, has proposed what's called the Madison Plan. <clears throat> the Madison Plan was conceived to address the university's need for diversity in a timely and comprehensive fashion. It proposes changes and improvements designed to make significant progress in attracting and retaining minority students, faculty, and staff. It details changes that enhance ethnic diversity in curriculum as a crucial element of educational excellence and offers a vision that promotes an ethnically diverse, non-discriminatory environment. This plan calls for students, financial assistant, assistance, student recruitment, student retention, faculty recruitment and retention, academic staff recruitment and retention, a curriculum that includes ethnic studies requirements for all students, a multicultural center, and a pledge, a pledge for a non-discriminatory environment. The Madison Plan recognizes that the university must maintain a climate which is not intimidating, hostile, or demeaning to anyone. What I think is most significant is at our forum in February, Vice President Butler
claimed that he wanted to have an open door for any student who would live to concern about racism. And in saying that, I think he uh, started the ball, ball to roll uh, for Armstrong to make a statement. I think an even stronger statement, though, needs to come out. Armstrong is a leader in this community. Sports-wise, we're going to become even a stronger leader. If the university concept is accepted, then we'll have even more of a leadership role. In taking this leadership role, we must create a vision. Where there's no vision, we will perish. We are training the future leaders of our community. We are training the people who will create a vision for Savannah not only Savannah, for the country and possibly for the world. And we train them uh, on some issues that they really need to be aware of. In 1950, the wages of 17 workers supported every retiree. In 1992, three workers will support every retiree. And one of those three workers will be in the year 2030, 2.2 workers' wages will support one retiree, and one of those workers will be a minority. It would behoove us then to train those workers to the best of their ability. They will have to be able to make intelligent decisions. They will have to maintain jobs that will contribute to the economic good. Problems such as health care, our growing population is a serious concern. The AIDS epidemic in those years will be even more serious. Dropouts will increase to 12 million in the year 2000. We must train people who are intelligent enough and have good enough skills to solve the problems that we're going to face. The world is changing, and as the world is changing, Armstrong is changing. Certainly, Otis Johnson entered here in 1963, accompanied by uh, police in riot gear. What will happen in the future? What will be the future of the students who enter here now and graduate? One thing that I observe every year at graduation is that I make a count of minorities who walk across that stage and receive their diploma. And the first year that I came here, I remember counting those minorities on one hand. Well, I've been able to add a few more fingers to that, but really what, and maybe another couple of hands too, but really what I would like to see at Armstrong is the number of blacks who enter and graduate and are retained in the right, in the same proportion as the whites who enter and retain, are retained. So if 100 whites then enter Armstrong and 50 of them graduate, then I would like to see out of, 100, out of 100 blacks who enter, 50 of those graduate. I think that's the true test of whether or not we are making any progress at Armstrong State College. What else might we want to see? The forum that we held recently called for an ongoing program to sensitize white faculty to minority concerns and issues. Certainly, if the research says that teachers are unaware of their expectations and their behaviors towards students, some training might need to be in place. Uh, it might be necessary that we look at developing high expectations for all students. Another is that we need to supply support organizations in the, in the way of, my, of sororities and fraternities to establish a network for minority students who come to this college. Also, we might look at multicultural activities that feature well-known blacks as role models. It might be that we want to require students to become acquainted with all aspects of our changing society. And then we might want to include in courses or designate a specific course that will acquaint majorities with those needs and issues that are raised by minorities. Certainly, another issue that was raised in that meeting was that we need to make more conversation among ourselves. We need to 
learn more about diversity, learn more about uh, what others' concerns are. And so, as I look at what, it, what is it like to be a token, I ask you to call upon your feelings of tokenism and realize that being a token might not be very easy. Being a token might entail feeling, feel, having feelings um, that are not positive feelings. It might entail loneliness and isolation. I guess the bottom line in being a token is that the person who is a token has to have positive feelings about himself. But if he has positive feelings about himself, where are those positive feelings from? They should certainly come from a significant other, from the faculty or from, from the students, from those people that, that that minority is exposed to. And so I hope that as we look at the phenomenon of tokenism, we think about those issues that I raised. Uh, we think about what we at Armstrong can do. Certainly we've come a long way. but we still have a long way to go. And I ask that you, as having experienced being a token, all of you raised your hand, that you think in terms of what you might do to encourage minorities who might not have had that experience one time, but might live that experience every single day. I thank you for your time. Observation and a question to help to give us some very uh, 